somebody like me in high school might have called you the lech. Yeah. Yeah. Well, to be honest, the vocabulary, at least in my uh, school in North Dakota, lech and lechery was a little bit above their grade. So I got a lot of leech. Uh, right. That's uh, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I once called Mark Marin, Mark Moron <laughs> on the show. And he said, you know, you're the only person who ever called me that. Right. Yeah. And I, and I went, really? Is it? Anyway. Uh, you're the co-host of Left Reckoning and Literary Hangover with everybody's favorite, Grace Jackson. And right. you're a producer, you're the producer of the Majority Report. I want to talk to you about UFC. Are they unionizing? Uh, Julian Assange and Elon Musk buying Twitter. Okay. Well, can I can I add a uh, topic to that list? Yes, I would. There are things I want to talk to you about before we get to that. So, what do you want to talk about? So, I uh, I'm not a reporter. I'm as you said a producer from Majority Report. So I don't I don't. I don't like when people look at me as if, you know, I, people sometimes make category errors of what certain people's roles are in media. But I did uncover a little something. So I've been obsessed with copperheads. Uh, I don't know if you know what copperheads are, David. What, the snakes? Well, that's where they get the name from. But a copperhead back during the during Civil, the Civil War, War. Exactly. Exactly. They were were they anti-immigration? No, they were uh, they were anti-Lincoln. Basically, they were pro-Confederate Democrats in the North. Uh, and you got uh, and I've also been doing a lot of John Wilkes Booth stuff. Anyway, in the context of doing that reading, I came across a, a story of the Christiana riots in Pennsylvania, which I'll just read from uh, Wikipedia here, just to borrow uh, quickly, so I don't have to characterize it. The Christiana riots uh, was the successful armed resistance by free blacks and escaped slaves to a raid led by fe a federal marshal to recover four escaped slaves owned by that, that, that Edward Gorsuch of Maryland. Uh, the raid took place in the early morning hours of September 11th, uh, 1851 at the house of, in Christiana, Pennsylvania, of William Parker himself, an escaped play, uh, a slave. Now this... Uh, so that would Gorsuch, be Ann Burford's great, great, the, the, the former EPA administrator under the, no through the through the dad side of the family oh, okay. it, there is a connection there though and uh, i was it was confirmed i just want to shout out the guy who confirmed it for me uh william r black on twitter found that uh neil gorsuch's neil's great 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 grandfather was edward's great great grandfather so they were uh third cousins five times removed so uh neil gorsuch related to that uh, slave driver who went to Pennsylvania to try to get his uh, slaves back and caught a bullet to the brain. Uh, so just a little interesting, you know, and I'm not the first person to make that uh, uh, guess. Apparently a libertarian blogger uh, hazarded that before, but uh, by me posting that someone was able to give me the full genealogy of it. And uh, look at that. Isn't it funny how certain families persist in, uh, right. in American history? His mother and Burford Gorsuch was, an EPA administrator under the Reagan administration, and she had to resign. I don't remember the details. It, it had something to do with not cooperating with, uh, I think, a congressional investigation of a Superfund site. He, he comes by his uh, anti-administrative state, uh, honestly, if such a thing is possible. Well, good work on that. Yeah. Yeah. And thanks to a uh, William Black as well. Uh, so for, yeah. Yeah. That's the nice thing about Twitter. Once you get a certain critical mass of followers, you can sort of like halfway finish the problem and be like, hey, can anybody, if you got some free time, uh, go do the actual legwork on this. So it's nice. Tell me about Elon Musk. Are you saying that he should be paying us? Oh, well, I think, yeah, I think that's the, the point is we need to think of an, and, and David made this even better on a point on left reckoning, but the, this idea that we're people sort of almost think it's a brand of uh, a point of pride to say, you know, we're the, the we make all this value, but it should be like a political uh, uh, goal or a political uh, marching order that if we're making all the value for this stuff, which we know we are in terms of like the amount of data they're collecting on us and, and at, it's on advertisements then I think the solution is to nationalize or at least to somehow come uh, over popular or yeah ownership of these platforms 
Uh, and you know, you can only do or turn them into utilities. Exactly. I mean, I think I would love to see the uh, post office uh, be put in charge of Twitter or something like that. And then you get algorithms out of it entirely. Or if you have algorithms, that'd be very basic ones that are completely transparent. Like anytime you're served an ad for something, you should be able to click on that ad and see what the advertisers know about you that made them want to place that ad. Like what, what uh, identity stuff? Cause I think it'd be very, and, and I'd rather just, you know, get ads out of it entirely and ban it, frankly. But if, if we're going to do this thing, uh, people should absolutely know the way they're being bought and sold on these ad markets. And right. uh, attention, you're literally like time on this earth is being bought and sold by these people. Right. People should also click on every ad they see because it confuses the algorithm. And if you hate the product being advertised to you, click on it because it costs them, it could be as much as $4 every time you click on a company. If you're in a bad mood, mm -hmm. click on a, an ad for a gun company. They'll keep sending you ads for Glocks. And every time you click on that ad, it's four dollars. It costs Glock four dollars, and they'll keep sending you the wrong ads. That's how you kind of culture jam the, the 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 gears of the machine. Yeah, you know, we get a lot of people that get concerned. You know, that they see a Ben Shapiro ad or something before a majority report, and I always say, like, one, we don't control that, but even so, you're you're wasting their money by getting served that ad. Basically, right. and all, the only cost is a little bit of your life. <laughs> and right. if that's if you're willing to pay for that, and, you know, uh, I think it's it uh, will t like that's a big chunk of uh, you know where our revenue comes from. It's right. Click on the ads, especially the companies that you find horrific. Yeah. You're taking money out of their pocket, and you're helping us. So click on the ads. I don't really advertise that much, but uh, I just do it on YouTube because it's, I don't know, I don't want to get into it with you. Uh, so Elon Musk, mm -hmm. say something in defense of Elon Musk. Oh, uh, well, this might be a little bit, uh, Elon Musk. but I think people might overstate the Emerald Mine thing, which what? is not to say, the Emerald Mine thing. And maybe I'm wrong about this. Maybe someone can, you know, can fill me up on the facts. But, you know, people always mention this Emerald Mine from Elon, right? That his dad owned an uh, Emerald Mine. Uh, and I think... South Africa? In South Africa, yeah. But I, he wasn't... I think, I think people fall into a trap of overstating that. I think he wasn't the owner of it. I think he had shares in it or something like that. I mean, he still, you know... <laughs> Uh, uh, made money from just owning stock in an emerald mine. That's that's plenty bad enough. But I think people sometimes overstate uh, that he owned the mine. So I just want to point that out there. People might be making stepping into uh, a little bit of uh, fake news. I might be wrong about that. If if I've just fallen for some uh, you know Elon apology uh, apology, I don't I don't know how to say that word. But if I've just fallen for some of that, uh, you know, let me know. But I that's my one thing I would say in defense of Elon is I don't think his dad owned. An emerald mine, uh, at least. So he's like, half a piece of shit. He's like, yeah, he's got shares into being like a total, like, you know, if he was a sole owner of an emerald mine, that is pretty, it's tough to like, on, on in terms of like human lives on planet Earth, that is, you know, you're in the upper percentile of being a piece of shit. But I think he just was invested in it, <laughs> uh, which does make you a little bit of a piece of shit, but you know. Do we talk about Elon Musk being a product of apartheid era South Africa? I don't think we talk about that enough. I mean, I think that like the Emerald Mine thing is nice because it's an, it's like a sort of uh, it's that in a nutshell. But I think it would be nicer to talk about. I mean, we should just talk about apartheid South Africa probably a little bit more and understand uh, the, and how it shaped him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I, go ahead. If you came from South Africa to America, would just out of human decency, wouldn't you kind of shy away from attacking the woke culture given <laughs> your country of origin? Yeah. Yeah, I'd probably be, me personally, I like to think that I would be a little bit sensitive about that. And I would, I'd be a little bit uh, more diligent about making sure there wasn't a, a sort of, uh, uh, cultivated there wasn't an extreme racist culture cultivated at my you know car plants for instance uh that would be something i would be on my watchword of like hey you're not going to get the benefit of the doubt if right. uh if people start calling 
uh, a, a section of your factory, the plantation, and you have a darker skin of worker uh, on those on those uh, on those stations, right. and who are being called the N word. How do you fix Twitter if Elon Musk were to call you and he said, "Hey, how, what would you like to see?" Like he he wants a way to edit tweets, and I understand why sure. you shouldn't be allowed to edit tweets because you can be retweeted and then go back and change what you've retweeted to something horrific uh, and get people canceled. Or you can say something that will get you canceled and then realize it's going to get you canceled and you go back and edit it and then you don't get canceled. And where's the fun of Twitter? Yeah. I mean, I, Facebook, you can edit posts, right? Yeah. And it has, yeah. It has, and it, I look at Facebook, it's a utopia now where every, right. it's just a utopia of expression. I mean, I, I frankly, I like the idea that you can edit a tweet and you can just see the whole revision history, maybe. So that, that's how Facebook used to do, where people would write something innocuous, then everyone would like share it and like it, and all of a sudden they change it to something horrible. Like we need to institute, you know, so people can see what the history of this message was. Like Wikipedia does. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's fine. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's pretty, uh, a small potatoes as far as like, look, the amount of money Elon's, my understanding is he took out $24 billion. Am I getting this right? It was $44 billion deal. And he took out like well, half 46, of, it's a 46 billion. Yeah. Yeah. He took out like half of that or a little bit over half of that in loans. Uh, I mean, I don't. They're not going to want to hear what I have to say, which is not seek a whole bunch of profit in any possible way that you can to try to pay these loans back. Uh, but that's what we're going to get. I mean, we'll see like, yeah, tiered uh, stuff, which I don't know. Maybe I can take advantage of that. I got 40,000 Twitter followers, but I, I mean, it's not going to make the service any better uh, by any sense of the imagination. I think it's going to be, I think it, I'm actually kind of curious to see how bad it can get because like i'm a little bit skeptical that it'll be that like he'll be that much worse than like jack dorsey for instance who you talk about like right-wing connections there's plenty to be concerned about with jack dorsey as well what do you mean? tell me about uh he did take a picture with that ali uh i think alexander the guy from the jan six uh he organized jan six I mean, he's a proud, is he a proud boy he's an african-american right yeah i don't know if he's a proud boy or just like an online sort of like um Right, oh, yeah, he's an Alex Jones guy. Yeah, I think he's more of an Alex Jones guy. Yeah, right. Um, and, and you know, Jack Doris is also a big crypto guy himself, uh, which I think to, personally is a red flag. Uh, and so you know, but that said, like you take out that much money to buy this thing, uh, and he's gonna, he's not gonna want to lose his uh investment either. I imagine they're gonna, <laughs> it's it's gonna be pretty wacky the type of advertisement stuff. I mean, if I wanted to fix Twitter myself. I mean, I always, I never trusted the algorithm timeline compared to the chronological one. I just think that invites abuse, particularly when it's not uh, transparent. You're just going to get corporate and, and even the stuff that's not corporate, but that's sort of trained to give you a dopamine rush that's in your little, uh, you know, bubble. Uh, I, I think that was bad. I think people should see what they sign up for. And uh, I, I think if you're talking about structural just changes to the timeline, that would be the first one that I would, I would go to. So Twitter has never made sense to me. The way it works now is Twitter decides, if you put some information out there, they decide how many of your followers will see yeah. what you put out there. And it's based on like, you know, it, I, I notice like somebody will like one of my tweets and then they'll all of a sudden start liking like a few in a row. And it's not just that they're all of a sudden loving my tweets again, like they just followed me for the first time. And, you know, it's that new follower feeling. It's that Twitter's all of a sudden realized like, oh, yeah, they actually do still like this person and want to see their content. So they're serving their content to them again. And I know it's tough. Like, you know, everyone fo I follow. I don't even know how many people, a couple thousand. Um, so it's, you know, I probably need to pair if they got rid of that. But I'm only, I've only allowed myself to get that far because... I think, uh, of this sort of algorithmic filtering. I see. So if you have a lot of followers, or if you're following, say, a thousand people, 
Mm-hmm. And your feed would be filled with a thousand posts and you'd be overwhelmed. They are the algorithm curates who you follow and tries to find the posts you're most likely to find interesting based on who you like. Exactly. So like I have an, an audience that's mainly political uh, sort of folks. If I tweet about basketball, which I do kind of regularly, uh, very few people see that. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, if I tweet something about Ben Shapiro, that thing's going to probably do some decent numbers in people's timelines. Interesting. So the algorithm knows that the people who like you hate Ben Shapiro. Yep. And they, so they, th- this accusation of shadow banning is true. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think it's, um, it is, it's, I don't think it's so uh, targeted. Certain folks think that they uh, were, an indivi- as an individual, have been, you know, singled out by Twitter HQ for a shadow ban and, and, and they're not going to be. I think that it's AI and it's learned that, like, people are engaging with this. And like Maria Bartiromo, right? Like you see a lot of these big corporate accounts and nobody engaged with the stuff, but probably because you're just tweeting out links to your show, Fox Business show every day. And, and right, like, and you're not creating an audience that's going to want the occasional time you say something good about Trump. Like, it's just, I, I think like, I, I think shadow banning is a smaller problem. I think like topics and that sort of stuff is, it's better to think about like just the, that sort of stuff is getting shaded more than individuals are being, you know, excised from the realm of, of uh, you know, the right. timelines. Because I don't, I don't really think that's happening. So I have an irrational hatred for filmmaker, actor, producer, husband and father, Rob Reiner, who I just think he's an asshole. Okay. I think he should, you know, I, I just do. I, I think he's the reason Democrats lose and, he, you know, he supports Biden and not Bernie. And he's just uh, lives in a bubble of entitlement and privilege and his Twitter feed there, there's another I share his Twitter feed because he'll write something like Macron wins democracy wins 8,000 retweets yeah you know, uh, or there's no other way to say this Marjorie Taylor Greene is a lying sack of crap 7,000 retweets uh Every day that goes by without Trump being indicted for leading a deadly insurrection to overthrow the United States government takes us one day closer to ending our democracy. So, and that says 5,000. So what you're saying is, and that's his timeline, he knows how to feed the algorithm. It's democracy, attack Republicans, nothing like, hey, I'm Rob Reiner, I'm a fat pig, I thought it was a fart, but I sharded myself as usual today because yeah. I'm stupid Rob Reiner. That doesn't fit into the algorithm. Yeah. So he, he's smart enough not to tweet his shards. Yeah, I mean, th- those are really good numbers. I think part of that is you have the Hollywood um, sort of popularity as well. Um, but a, a pure example is, I don't know if you're familiar with the Occupy Democrats, which David and I left record and we're not huge fans of. But it's 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 a Twitter account, just Occupy Democrats, and it's always stuff like a uh, breaking new poll and reveals that 85% of Americans, I mean, this is a good one, I agree with this, but this is just what they do. Under the age of 30, support federal action on student loan debt. Democrats have been discussed the possibility of debt, debt forgiveness. Retreat if you think that President uh, Biden should do it before the midterms. And it's always like a call to action, like that sort of stuff. Right. Um, and a lot of like, yeah, going after DeSantis. I mean, I, I don't mean to say like all the things you'll see on Occupy Democrats is objectionable, but their way of going at things, I, I think is really up All right. I learned a lot today from, I'm being serious. It's a consistent message on Twitter. That's how you work the algorithm. Yeah. It give, give the people what they want repeatedly and just keep giving it to them over and over again. And Don't. embed media if you can. And what? Embed media. So to put a picture or video with it, it would do even better. What about if I just keep saying Rob Reiner sharded himself today over and over again? Then I could just grow followers who pretty much agree with me that Rob Reiner sharts himself three times a day. 
Yeah, it's tough though, because because like I'm saying, like that might be like my basketball tweets, and I'm worried that it's just going to get filtered out. Yeah. yeah. Um, it might be better to start a separate account. Uh, <laughs> just devoted to that entirely. Did you ever see Coffee Dad? By the way. No. Oh. Follow Coffee Dad. Okay, Coffee Dad. Uh, it's the greatest Twitter. Fo- it is the best Coffee Dad. Interesting. It, it's it's a father who tweets, and it's like every three weeks he has a tweet. Had coffee today. <laughs> Two weeks later, love my coffee. <laughs> Four weeks later, he would have been 25 today. (laughs) It's like, it's coffee dead. And then another month goes by, love freshly ground coffee. (laughs) Three weeks later, he didn't see the curve. (laughs) It's the, are there other Twitter accounts like that? Like coffee dead that you know of that are like. Oh gosh, I feel like. That's used to be all Twitter was like in 2014 is and now now all those accounts are like DSA members, I feel like. Uh, but uh, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know exactly. Damn, there is some examples, but I'm, I'm just blanking out. What all right. Are. For our Joe Rogan listener, we have one. Uh, UFC is going union. I saw Ben Burgess on with Joe Rogan talking about the John Deere strike and Rogan goes, that's crazy. John Deere went on strike. Well, yeah, maybe if you uh, actually cared about your listeners, you would know that uh, the workers are striking. Yeah. They're going on strike right around the time you were having charlatans on to say ivermectin was a, was an alternative to vaccination. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So the UFC is unionizing. Uh, so I think we had uh, Elias Cepeda on, who's an MMA sort of a former fighter. I don't know if he still fights as uh, sort of like semi-active, um, but he's uh, re- he got the skinny on Dana White, uh, and they do not have a union at this moment. I believe there's support among the fighters for a union. I'm not sure uh, how far along they are in the process, but it is you know I, I feel like that is to me uh, that's what a requirement for being a sport. If you you got to have some kind of players association or union, right? Like baseball, football, basketball, all got that. Uh, with UFC, where you know the players, the fighters don't have control over often like when who they're fighting. Uh, and, that, and I mean, there's they, like there's so much control over those guys' bodies and promotion and stuff like that, which is equally uh, distributed. That I mean, they absolutely need uh, need some sort of. Uh, Players union, uh, fighters union, um, and there's also a very interesting dynamic where Dana White, the owners of UFC, they realized in the '90s because John McCain w- said that it was human cockfighting, uh, and so in the '90s, like we need to embrace uh, embrace regulation as, as opposed to run away from it. They uh, went to the Nevada Gaming Commission, and the Nevada Gaming Commission uh, said no, and then two members of the Nevada Gaming Commission went and bought uh, UFC after they said no and it lost a lot of value. And uh, and then later it did get passed by the Nevada Gaming Commission into you know, regulation. Uh, so that's, and then those guys put Dana White in charge. Uh, and so a really fascinating, sleazy history of uh, UFC that uh, uh, I, I thought was really fascinating. Without Don King getting involved. Do you enjoy MMA? I... I used to more than I do now. I, I used to have a bunch of my roommates liked it uh, years ago. And I'm a little bit squeamish. <laughs> I got to admit now. I, 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 um, it's weird. Like, I don't like to see breaks uh, at all. I think that, that th- those are the things that really, like, push me over the edge. Uh, for some reason, I can watch a guy get hit in the face in slow motion. Um, uh, that, that's somewhat interesting. Uh, and I can I can see the beauty in like some of the technical aspects of the fights. But if something really brutal happens, uh, I'm not, that's not like really what I'm looking for. I will watch female MMA because I'm a baby boomer. And it's like everything that I was trained not to believe is like, it's like, okay, 
I, it's time for me to go on the ice flow and disappear from our society when I watch it. When I watch female MMA, I'm, it, I find it comforting because I, I surrender to old age and that I'm irrelevant. I, I just watch it. Okay, this makes absolute, everything I was raised to believe about everything. Yeah. Is uh, I do I do feel like yeah for I mean definitely most of my life I didn't have access to a video of women who could kick your ass <laughs> um, uh, so readily. Finally, uh, on a very serious subject, and I know our next guest will want to talk about this as well. Last week, Julian Assange uh, moved one step closer to being uh, extradited to the United States on espionage charges. I think it's left to the Home Secretary in the United Kingdom, the Great Britain, Pretty Patel, I think is her name. She's the Home Secretary. It's up to her to decide whether or not to follow through and send him here, uh, where British judges have said, you know, he comes to America, he faces certain suicide. That's, that's why they delayed it. They said the American prisons are so bad if he comes here, he will commit suicide. Uh, we should be celebrating Julian Assange. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I mean, gosh, um, I remember reading about this like 10 years ago and you hear guys being like, yeah, they would never send him to the States because for that reason, it was just clearly not a government that, by law in, in the UK, like you can't give it to a government that is possibly going to torture. And we say possibly, like absolutely going to torture uh, Julian Assange. Uh, it is just like what form that is, like what kind of sensory deprivation. If it's not like, you know, waterboarding at Guantanamo, it's going to be something. Solitary. Real, exactly. Torture. Right. Solitary is torture. And yeah. And, and they're so dogged because. Uh, they want to send a message worldwide that anybody that does anything to help expose uh, U.S. Uh, war crimes uh, is gettable. Like even if you're an Aussie citizen, uh, we'll get you. And uh, those sorts of uh, things that we put in to your government's laws about how you'll never extradite to a government that tortures or something like that. We just mean that about like, you know, those other nasty third world sort of dictator types. We don't mean that about Uncle Sam. Right. Our military commits war crimes and they never own up to them. The only way they will say, yes, uh, civilians were killed is if Seymour Hirsch reports on Me Lai or Chelsea Manning releases the video of the Apache helicopter killing 13 Iraqis, including two Reuters civilians, just two Reuters re reporters. While they were laughing, yeah. laughing. Well, and then look at the messages you get from all of that, which is like me lie. It's it's that the these like low level guys got out of control. When we know that there's probably a lot of me lies, um, and then like the Abu Ghraib lesson was again the exact same one. Is these folks at this prison got out of control? It's it, it's never to look up, upward, right? right? And like I mean, like you mentioned about Obama, right? Like what's the problem we're dealing with now? It's gonna look downward at you. You freaks, I can't get the information straight in your little heads. And if you can only do that, uh, you know, maybe we, democracy would be safe, but you know, it's your fault. Uh, it's right. interesting how that always works. This was great. Please come back. Matt Leck is co host of the podcast Left Reckoning and Literary Hangover with Grace Jackson. And he is the producer of the Majority Report. Fantastic. And I'm glad Thanks, I'm feeling better. Yeah, I will we'll be uh, feeling okay. Let's yeah. Back and together. Amen. Thank you. See you. Left is best. <laughs>